Good morning, and thank you for coming to this oddly titled talk. Um, I will happily let anyone who felt this in later, but I will start going now. <laughs> this is being recorded for posterity, so please watch your language. <coughs> there will be no mention of IE6 other than this in the talk, so there should be no occurrence for swearing. So, this talk is about the future, not the past. The future is here, what's Drupal got to do with it? I invite anyone who would like to uh, take notes or make comments to do so on the the pad um, link there, either pad.mozilla.org slash futures dash here. Um, and also, if it doesn't get too big, to feel free to interrupt with questions. The discussion style is always preferable. Uh, my name is Benjamin Manson. I am a worker owner at Agaric, a web development collective, sort of centered in the Boston area. We have three people here, and we have one in Hamburg and one in Nicaragua. I am one of the ones more or less in this area, hanging out in Cambridge and Nick. So, we uh, expected a lot from the future. We had anticipated a wondrous future of life-changing technology, and the hope was always that we would um, control the technology and not the other way around. Somewhere along the way, we got a little bit off track. This is um, you know, a modern car um, from Chrysler, and uh, it has been hacked by people um, <laughs> accessing the um, media player in the car through a remote network, and the media player is hooked up to <laughs> the power steering <laughs> and the brakes. Chrysler has recalled 1.4 million automobiles because of this. This is not <laughs> like little old aberration. The, the, the hackers spent you know, some months figuring it out, and it's a real serious, insanely bad exploit. Um, and yeah, through, through the media console. So this is, this is proving Cory Doctorow right, and another thing, as he often is in many things. Um, his point is that computers and the internet are everywhere, that we are um, regularly inside computers. Um, modern cars are computers that we put our bodies into, and then hearing aids and pacemakers are computers that we put inside us. Um, and, uh, and airplanes are flying computers. This is um, an Airbus that crashed this May due to a software bug. Um, four people died. Um, the rest of the model of Airbus is uh, being, you know, grounded until they they fix the bug. Um, you know, software is powering everything. Software is extremely important. Um, but you know. It's not to say that software isn't, on the whole, making our lives far, far, far safer. Um, for instance, we do not yet have software driving our cars for us. We're doing that ourselves, and you know, 30,000 of us are dying annually, um, well over um, 2 million um, in the history of driving ourselves around in automobiles. Um, this, this which is not exaggeration. So, um, but the, the future is in fact here on, on the, uh, more on the scale we expected. Um, and, you know, more and more things being powered, um, you know, amazing technology, the stuff that's indistinguishable from magic in some cases is being powered by software. And the only thing that could make this firm, this, this um, picture more perfect is if um, everybody were looking at their smartphone, their, you know, high-powered um, com handheld computer uh, at the same time while being ridden around by stabilizing computers. Um, the, the importance of all of these things being computers, general purpose computers that can actually be modified to, to run anything is, is critical for both the 
um, you know, our freedoms and our protection. Um, it, you know, Drupal is free software. It is GPL. Um, it has allowed many of us to um, make a living because we can check out the source code. We can get it out for free. Everyone can contribute and build on it. Um, a lot of the software that's powering all these things is not free software. It is not open to inspection. It is controlling critical things in our lives, and we cannot um, control it. And so just to remind of the four freedoms, it is to run a program as you wish for any purpose. Um, and that includes the soft, should include the software in your car. Study how the program works and change it, access sort code, so access to the source code. It redistribute copies so you can help others distribute copies of modified versions. Um, and you know, the same as we have now with web software, you can do this in a secure way. Um, it doesn't mean you know, we should be well past the concept of, oh my god, you know, it's open source, that means anyone can go in and edit it. No, the point is to have um, systems where you know um, exactly what your software is and you can control, um, you know, what, what you choose to install. But in order to do that, you need to be um, in control. Um, the um, the back doors that, um, that government sometimes want to put in to control um, your software for your own good is it makes it inherently insecure. All right, the future is already here. These are solar panels powering cell, cell phone reception in Nepal. Um, and it's just not very evenly distributed. This is a prison in West Virginia. All right, so um, talking about the the types of software that, um, you know, the, the, the pieces of the future that are affecting directly our, um, our circumscribed lives on the web um, and as designers and web developers. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the real back to the future slide. Um, this is static websites um, becoming popular again, um, you know, for web developers of, of my time, the whole point was to get clients off of static sites into a content management system so that they would gain control again. It was all about giving control to the client. If they had a static website, they needed to hire a web designer to, you know, change the hours for their business, to, you know, make a little edit. It was, you know, this is terrible. Give them a content management system. Once you build it for them, um, then they can go in and edit things. They have much more control. Um, but uh, content management systems have uh, something of a da downside. They are much more energy intensive to use. The internet is using is causing two percent of um, uh, carbon output right now, which is the same as air travel. <laughs> There's not much you can do that's worse than getting on a plane and um, and flying somewhere to to. Uh, increase global warming, but just our, all of us building websites and watching them. And I mean, let's be honest, it's mostly video that's doing this. Um, but still, big fat websites and your server chugging along every time someone visits is doing its share of carbon emissions, too. Um, so Jekyll sort of solves this. Um, it's becoming especially popular because it's powering um, GitHub pages. Um, so that, you know, if you pretty much any project that's hosted on GitHub um, that, you know, feels that they want a little bit more than that default GitHub listing page um, will make a little website and it'll still be on host on GitHub, just simple files marked up in Markdown like um, in Jekyll and then, and then a theme applied to it. Um, so GitHub is essentially acting as the, um, the the content management system for static websites. So it makes it very easy for programmer types. Um, they're used to interaction with GitHub. They're used to using version control if they need to. Um, but I mean, you can just, you know, a, a GitHub hosted site, you can just go to the source code, you know, make a pull request and the person can bring it in. It's actually a much better um, workflow 
um, than, you know, saying, hey, you with the content management system, you've got a typo on, you know, this page, you know, do it. It's like you're not likely to have given, you know, a random person access to actually edit your site, um, but you can give people access to the source code. But that's still something that only, you know, only developers, only people who work with code, some designers are going to get into. Um, you could easily imagine uh, making a front end that works pretty much the same as, as what GitHub allows. You go in, you know, you say, oh, um, you know, give me, make me a copy of the, the source of the page here and let me edit it, you know, just the content of the page. Um, but it gets rid of all of the, the GitHub stylings and all the I'm about to enter a terminal command line feel um, and just make a massive hosted um, set of sites that, um, that you know, it's, it's stored in version control and output. So you log into um, a central management of it. Anyone can log in, make a clone of anyone's site, edit, make a pull request. Um, um, and just, just hold that thought because I, you know, I thought it was original, um, but we're going to get to something that uh, has something of this idea already. Squarespace is um, is the so the top hosted um, alternative to websites, and you may have recommended people go there if you didn't think they could afford your services um, or send them to WordPress. Um, we don't have a really nice hosted Drupal yet. Um, Aqueous Drupal Gardens was sort of a you know an effort at that, but it hasn't the the effort hasn't continued to go into that particular platform. Um, and it's a shame. I mean, the idea that people can get started easily with something, that they don't have to find their own server, they don't have to even find their own domain name, they don't have to, um, you know, usually you want your own domain name, but you don't have to do everything. It's just go, click, get started. Um, there's nothing fundamentally stopping uh, Drupal from doing this, and we'll get to examples of uh, distributions that are, in fact, um, uh, giving this this hosted option, uh, and so the the common thread in in these things, um, well, that we're getting to now is uh, a good user experience. Um, you know, very focused. You know, it's simpler than Drupal. It's a it's a reduced use case. The same as you know, people feel WordPress is often easier. It's got a more um, precise use case. Um, but you can build things with Drupal that have a really good user experience. The question is, it's, it's a matter of having the resources to put the energy into it. And I'm really excited about figuring out the business models that allow those kinds of resources, the design effort to go into making Drupal um, awesome F for specific use cases like hosting small business websites. Um, now we get to the real feature attacking us where we live. Um, the grid.io. Um, is put, billing themselves as artificial intelligent um, web design. And it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. The, the fundamental thing is that, you know, making, you know, making the alignment of the pixels and the stuff that very few of us even like to do um, isn't, you know, at least do, doing a decent job of it isn't something that a human actually needs to do. So their their point is, you give them the content, you give them the pictures. It just makes uh, you know a, a website exactly like this. They claim that this is hosted on their software. I think their beta is just going. Um, Agaric is on the list um, to try it, but we haven't gotten it yet. Um, and. Um, and another thing that's interesting is they're explicitly um, billing themselves as giving you more control, um, getting out of the walled garden, the the um, the pre-made world of Facebook, um, and hosting your own site. So this also is in some ways a throwback to you know the web, where if you wanted to a place on the web, you had your own site and you didn't give all of your data over to um, Facebook or Twitter to, um, to, be, to be your home. And they are explicitly pushing this and, and trying to make it very, very easy for people to um, 
you know, e easier even than Squarespace or WordPress or anything. Just throw in the content, the site designs itself. Um, and that's actually not really out of Drupal's grasp either. Um, if, if Drupal were still on its own, you know, developing this kind of, you know, really powerful artificial intelligent engines. And a lot of what, um, a lot of what um, the grid.io does is, is just, um, um, is, is just is just stuff that we have, but we don't yet have a good user interface for, like bringing in feeds from any other sites on the internet so that you can publish content from those feeds rather than having to do it yourself. That's something Drupal has been able to do since 2001. Um, it had the RSS aggregator in there. Um, but having a really nice interface for turning feeds into content, and um, you know, we still haven't put the effort into that. And now there's a whole new range of things like the positioning of images and text and trying to design a website itself that you know once if, if the grid.io proves that you can do it people are going to figure out how to do it in free software also and this is where it's a huge advantage that Drupal 8 is going to be built on Symfony and um, Composer the dependency manager so that very likely this sort of artificial intelligence stuff is going to become a library that we can just pull in. Um, because, you know, Drupal 8 is going to be built on Symfony largely, um, or is built on large chunks of Symfony, um, but we're hardly alone in projects using Symfony. Um, PHBB, which has been around forever, is also rebuilding on, on Symfony. Laravel, which some people love, is, is built on many Symfony components. Symfony itself has a website as well, you know, a, a content management system as well as um, these components. Easy Publish, um, Silex is another thing from the same people who produce Symfony. Um, and even Typo3, which is a huge um, PHP CMS, um, is using Composer and, and one other um, component from Symphony. So, of all of these things, you know, there's going to be a lot of energy to develop, you know, some of these really cool libraries that are going to let Drupal get to um, the future right along with proprietary options, um, I feel. So, and so the question is, what are the, the business, like, what's the business model for for doing it, like proprietary software has the advantage of, you know, the you know the grid.io can get three million dollars in funding or whatever they got, and they can expect to make that money back over time because they're holding their, their what they develop proprietary. They can sell it little bit by little bit over time. Um, free software, you know, you would invest three million into it. It's a little bit harder to exercise that control and let it out piecemeal um, and, and recoup that investment times, you know, 10 or whatever your investors expect to make off of it. Um, it would be better for the world. Many more people would have better sites, more cool things would happen, but you can't make the money. So, um, and if, you know, we don't have a business model of doing anything, then we're not going to be able to do cool things. Um, this is another um, Cory Doctorow quote. Um, and it has a good, um, I mean, the point is the business model um, that free software has long had is, um, is the same one that's proven successful with technology diffusion generally. Um, people have brought, you know, um, apps. I mean, they, they first they brought, you know, the first micro, you know, first non-mainframe computers into work or brought data home in order to um, do their jobs more efficiently. Um, and now people use web apps and all kinds of things that aren't, you know, aren't built, aren't, you know, um, uh, defined as wanted, as, as desired by their company, but they go out and do it anyway. And, you know, some companies are realizing this and realizing that they don't want to be buying a proprietary solution from someone else. So big enterprises have a lot of good reasons for supporting free software and so that they can have internal innovation um, and that, you know, people can build on it. Um, but um, that's, that's only, that's, 
you know, that's sort of the free software model that we have now. Like um, Linux is huge. Um, the kernel work on it gets done. Um, work on some of the other GNU components around um, the Linux kernel um, because there's really large enterprises that need it. Um, and they don't consider, you know, that part of it necessarily their competitive advantage. Even Facebook is, is making free, um, is freeing um, some really cool stuff uh, about how they do really performant um, PHP and such. Um, but that's, that's again, those are, those are things that sh benefit huge businesses. If we are going to innovate, if we are going to um, reach people where they are, we need business models that, um, that, uh, that can gain money for designers and developers from more directly from from end users um, so atrium is another is an example of of the enterprise it is one of the more successful um, Drupal distributions um, going back a um, bunch of years to Drupal 6 um, and yeah and um, and having a second version um, and and used by a large number of sites um, but starts to get more interesting with the, just the sheer number of Drupal distributions. This is something that Drupal has been, tr you know, saying we need to do for a long time, and it's it's really happening. I mean, we have the diversity. We have we have the experiments out there. Um, this one is for epidemiological studies, um, and this one is uh, it's it, this one is also institution um, funded. Um, it is not um, being funded by direct users and and honestly very few will be but as we go on we we get to some that have more interesting um direct users um this is this is actually one of two distributions that are tailored to the australian government website guidelines i don't know what australia is doing but they are really um really nailing it um so this this is um you know this is just sort of standard like great way to um you know, to be able to put more effort into making something really good for a particular purpose. Um, and I think it was helped by Australia having clear guidelines. Um, and, you know, again, we're not getting down to individuals, but local governments um, can get pretty close to the people. And, and this distribution sort of enables the work of many to be captured into um, one focused piece of software. Open Lucius is a um, team collaboration project management system built on Drupal. This one is particularly interesting because now we finally have one that's not just a distribution. People can download and install themselves. Um, it has a hosted version. So this is free software, but is also software as a service. So it's sort of the ideal of the convenience. You can sign up and use it. But I can still inspect the source code. I can still make improvements, and you know I can certainly get all of my data and take it um, in house if my needs diverge from the main platform. Or potentially, I can make improvements that get adapted by um, the hosted version. Recruiter is um, another focused distribution. Um, this one does not have a, um, a software as a service version at this time. Opigno LMS does have a software as a service version. This is a learning management system. This is definitely a vertical that is very attractive for free software. Um, the Erpl platform is, this one does not have a hosted version, but they are very explicit. Um, it's a crazily um, flexible, um, you know, it can do accounting systems and all kinds of stuff um, for, for business applications. Pretty much every time this is going to be customized, so the, the developers behind this are just very explicit in saying, look, you can hire us to get it customized, um, but you're not starting from scratch. Open Aid by Aiton Design Group is a very nice um, distribution, and it has a project page on Drupal.org. Um, Drupal.org slash project slash open aid, but it is also hosted on Pantheon, which is a really nice, um, you know, middle ground between, okay, I'm going to do my own software as a service, 
um, or I'm just going to maintain a distribution. Now people can just go to Pantheon, say, I want that one, and have a site. Um, I don't believe that Pantheon is doing something like providing kickbacks to developers of of um, distributions, which would be really nice, you know, if a couple bucks from anyone installing pure Drupal on Pantheon went to Drupal Association and anyone installing OpenAid, you know, a couple bucks went to, a month went to Aiden Design Group. Um, I'd be very curious if anyone's thinking along those lines because it, you know, really helps to develop something if you've got at least the hope of, of bringing some money in for continued work on it. Restaurant distribution, really exciting. Also, no hosted one um, at this time. Um, no software as a service, but you could easily see using it to do a software as a service distribution, a service software as a service restaurant focused sites. Um, Roomify, this one is one that also does have a software as a service and the um, and distribution and suite of modules on Drupal.org. Um, uh, Again, this is, you know, once you have a, some, a sort of business model, you can put a lot of effort into making um, the application run really well for your particular purpose. This is my favorite. I haven't actually gotten a chance to try it yet. Uh, <laughs> but um, this is farmier.com, um, which is the hosted service, the software as a service version of the farm OS um, um, Drupal distribution. Um, actually, it's just the um, Drupal.org slash project slash farm is the distribution, and they have a whole bunch of, of modules supporting it. Okay, so that's um, that's all of the all of the you know, distributions that are sort of taking Drupal to the next level. That sort of give us the idea of okay, there's a business model here that. We can take little pieces of the future. We can take the shiny things. We can take the better experiences that other people may be doing in proprietary things. And we have a business model to put the effort in and make it free software. Um, so, so, like throwing the solar panel on, on the hut. Um, but I want to take a step back and, and point out that you know, the future out there um, that is here in our present isn't all positive. It's not a matter of, of getting the the good parts, you know, just taking more future and, and you know, more futuristic things and making it part of Drupal. There's a lot of things that are um, uh, not so good in our in our technological landscape now, and that um, that applies to what we're dealing with in in uh, free software also. So I mean, this is in in the physical technological world, but in the in the more um, and then in the business models out there and what's happening, um, the, um, the, there's, um, there's also sort of um, a uneven distribution of benefits. And so, um, you know, the example here is um, things like Facebook which are built on the open web. They're built using lots of free software, um, but they are, are privatizing the gains. Um, this, is, sorry, this is very similar to um, our, uh, our oil industry, our energy industry. Um, very capital intensive um, development, centralized um, benefits and externalized costs, costs borne by everybody. So in the first quarter of 2015, Facebook had 1.44 billion uh, monthly active users. And so for many people, Facebook is the internet. Uh, the average smartphone user checks it 14 times a day. Um, and this is, I'm quoting from um, Ben Wordmuller, who I'll get to software he works with soon. Um, and are all these part people wrong? Or you know, have Facebook and apps, he quotes the number of apps downloaded by Google, just snuck up and eaten the web's lunch. Um, for most people, Facebook and other um, focused proprietary apps are easier to use and crucially free. If it is easier to make money by violating users' autonomy than by protecting it, guess which way the market will go. And the irony here is that 
the the value of Facebook, the value of a large number of these companies that are um, predicated on violating your privacy, on you know basically not respecting your rights as a human being, let alone a user of software, um, that value is coming from you. <laughs> the um, Axiom is, a, is the people who spy on all your credit card stuff, so they they have more information about what you purchase than you do. You can use something like Mint and try to like you know figure out how how much you spent and stuff, but you just have like you spent you know sixty dollars at Stop and Shop. Axiom knows that you spent you know three dollars on um, the um, toast and all you know all that stuff. Um, and this is so this is. You know, this is valuable data. This is this is value, unquestionably valued in the market. That is sort of, by any reasonable expectation, it it should be yours. A lot of Uber's value is knowing where you are, where you want to go, and knowing who is willing to drive you. Um, Palantir technology is just straight up spying. Um, Yelp is <laughs> that's not the Palantir in Drupal. There's very different. Um, and uh, Yelp is, you know, all of our views, and, and this is, you know, great. They've sort of unlocked value. That's that's great, and they they are giving value back to us. Um, but the problem, especially with um, Yelp, Facebook, and Google, is that in order to extract um, the value from the data in a way that they benefit from, so we benefit from Yelp giving, you know, passing on these. You know, other people's reviews of stuff. We benefit. You know, the data is coming from us. The information is coming from us. The work is coming from us. But still, we benefit. How does Yelp get a slice of that? Well, they have to start corrupting what the benefit is. They have to start, you know, telling businesses, hey, if you advertise with us, maybe a couple of those bad reviews will go away. I mean, they do this with a wink and all that stuff. Um, but it's, you know, they they need. They need to extract the value somehow. So their business models are not predicated on um, sort of the same things that make them valuable. They're, they're predicated on twisting it just enough so that we still get value, but they can do it. So Facebook's like their whole value is connecting you with your friends, but in order for them to extract value from it, they need to say, you know what? We're not going to show you what your friends have to say right now. We're going to show you some ads instead. And we're going to show you some ads that bring in your friend's name and other creepy stuff. Um, and you know, Google the same way. So these are valuations based largely on our data. Um, and they are providing value to us, but they actually have to degrade the, their service in order to make money from us. Um, and I just, um, you know, so that's just what I'm saying. Waze, which was bought by Google for uh, I forget a lot, um, billion something, um, at least. Uh, it was very, it's very explicit. So when you use Google Maps, um, it's trying to give you the best directions possible um, by looking at, oh, you know, your friend up the road, uh, you know, he's not moving, so we're probably going to tell you to take a different route. Um, and you know, that's again. So every and and. and Every time we use Google Maps, we're giving it more data about how to get places. That's, that's value that's coming from us. And so I guess my biggest thing is that there's, you know, as a co somewhat cohesive community, um, we can actually look at, OK, where's the next place that value is going to come from our data and come up with a business model where, you know, a bunch of people pool their resources up front going on it together and um, create a service that's not relying on you know selling out to venture capital and ultimately ads getting shoved down our throats so Waze is one that went that way um, but it's you know this is still waze.com this website is still up you know Google still maintains it um, but as I'm saying most of the tricks of giving you good directions that Waze uses has, is also in, in Google's main maps product and in Apple Maps and everything else. I mean, Apple was able to create huge value in their mapping software by just saying, yeah, it's terrible right now, but we're going to make you all use it. And and so, you know, and everyone's locked into the, the suite of things. And so 
Apple get a ton of data and their maps are, you know, getting better, I think. I don't use it, but um, the complaints seem to have gone down out there. Um, so Waze is just saying explicitly get the best route every day with real-time help from other drivers. Nothing can beat real people working together. It's very explicit that the value is coming from the people in its network. Uh, this is um, on Facebook. Um, there's a, a research experiment not that long ago on that Facebook did. They published it in a psychological journal. It wasn't just like it leaked out. They published the results of an experiment where like, yeah, we're going to show more people sad status updates from their friends and see if it affects their mood. Um, which, I mean, people freaked out about. Honestly, this is some of the more ethical stuff that Facebook does is, is try to figure out how to make sure that they don't, um, you know, I, I think they act, you know, they, 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 they don't want to drive anyone to suicide. They don't want to do anything like that. Like, it, unless, of course, it's to an advertiser's benefit. But so in, <laughs> they're mostly trying to figure out how to, <laughs> I'm sorry, they're mostly trying to figure out how to, um, how, how to just, you know, keep people interacting well, not be too upset by stuff they see and all of that stuff. And they're just studying, like, wow, like, we change a little bit of our algorithm that changes people's mood. That's crazy. Um, for an advertiser, they'll be like, Hey, yeah, so in the mornings, you know, she's sort of sad. She's going to be really susceptible to you selling whatever the hell you're selling, um, which is, you know, the creepy feature of advertising that's awful. Um, but it's the alt text on this XKCD cartoon that is that is the, the kicker. Um, I mean, it's not like we could just demand to see the code that's governing our lives. What right do we have to poke around in Facebook's private affairs like that? Um, you know, the algorithms, the code that's determining how our relationships run, these are things that, um, you know, we really need to try to reclaim for, you know, personal health, um, political, and um, ultimately economic also reasons. All right, so that's uh, the, the brighter future that we want to get to, um, replacing centralized, um, you know, um, industries like oil, centralized industries like the silos of Facebook and Twitter, um, where even when they're doing good things, it's just a lot of concentrated power and an attempt to extract value from a large network um, rather than the network deciding how its value gets used itself. Um, and the alternative is a little bit similar to the energy revolution that's happening now, where all of these resources were invested in um, in nuclear, in hydroelectric, in um, coal and oil, and still are. They're still massively subsidized um, by central governments, and that's because, you know, if you're in business, you're like, well, I can, you know, I can lobby for the the access to the oil. I can lobby for the tax breaks. I can do all of this stuff. Um, and I can centralize all of the benefit. The same, um, ver you know, the, the, that, that vicious downward cycle with bad energy didn't happen with some better options like solar and wind, in large part because it's much harder for one central player to capture those benefits. But the inherent strength, even without, um, you know, fossil fuels, et cetera, having to pay the environmental costs of the damage they're doing, even without that, the inherent strengths of solar and wind, um, with just a little bit of a boost, you know, um, in um, in public policy, they're still not nowhere near the subsidies that oil gets. Um, they're they're starting to win, uh, and the idea I'm putting forth is the metaphor that um, that the independent web that um, are self-hosted sites can potentially um, do the same thing. So this is a quote from Dries Bortart, the um, founder of Drupal, very smart guy. Um, this is a while back. Walled gardens are winning because they have a superior user experience. Um, and this is echoed by a number of people who work with free software and take a fair and honest look at it. And it's simply easier and more fun to share things on Twitter and Facebook. Um, you know, you don't have to set up your own blog. People don't have to figure out how to follow you. It all just works. It's built into the system. Um, but it's not impossible to build this into a distributed system. Um, so the idea is that we, you know, share data, 
and somehow profit. Um, but the, the, the point that the value is in the data is huge. Therese again, in an even more recent blog post, talking about the way that um, the value is shifting from the software. You know, mapping software is starting to become commodity. Um, but the data that's behind the maps, that's where the value is. You know, Netflix, the value is in the recommendation engine. Um, and so I wanted to close by introducing um, everyone in Drupal to this indie web community, which is trying to build an independent web with a strong focus on usability, a strong focus on shipping software. Um, that's the other thing I wanted to emphasize, is that we have distributions. We're doing things in Drupal, and that's key. Just talking about, well, you know, is this a potential business model? Is that basically doing what I'm doing is useless, whereas um, going out and building stuff is powerful. And so um, the person I was quoting before about, um, you know, the long similar lines that Dries was, but um, talking about the um, the the um, the the way people gravitate towards Facebook because it's providing an easier user experience. Um, he's um, in this indie web camp community. Um, they call it indie web camp because they mostly work on the software and like two day camps and just random places in the world. Um, but he has a software called Known, which um, he's had some success in selling to the educational community. And where they want this ability to um, to have all the things we're used to in social networks of following someone um, and you know being able to reply to someone, but it's all being done with independent or can be done with independent websites, and it works pretty seamlessly. Still, a lot of things that the experience needs to be got improved, um, but they're working on building it, um, and there is um, these same features are are being. Um, are, are in Drupal. Um, and again, it's uh, not necessarily the importance of any particular software, um, but the, you know, finding a community that's actively trying to reclaim the open web. Um, one of the quotes is from a, a post by Dreet Borthardt on reclaiming the open web. Very good post worth reading. Um, but you know, as we've seen, it's it's much more than the web that we're talking about reclaiming now. Um, the, the network connected world is you know your exercise monitor. There's going to be a huge amount of data in that. It should is that going to be something where one you know exercise monitor company or two, ultimately Apple and Google because they get to control the data in the end. Um, you know, are are where all of our fitness stats go, or can we create a federated data system where People are in control of their data, um, decide where it's shared. Um, and these are still, you know, the, the potential for business opportunities are still very much here. And there's, you know, large institutions that are looking for, um, you, know, you know, I'm sure you've had clients who say, like, oh, I want a discussion forum. And you have to go through with them. Well, do you have anywhere near the draw to get enough people to go, you know, register on your site? and all of that stuff and actually have a community on your site. In many cases, they don't. But there are a lot of institutions that do have the money to give us money to develop websites that give people a good user experience that if we could say, hey, you know, there is a way other than just outsourcing your comments to Facebook or Discuss that people can you know, easily join your community without having to separately log into your site and all of that. Um, that's the, one of the promises of indie, the indie web movement, and that's something that I, you know, that we have sort of the institutional allies to start building um, right now. Um, I'm going to stop rambling, open up for questions, and thank you so much. Um, yeah, some are, some are using Agar, Eager, Ager, however you say it. Um, Iger. Iger, Iger, thank you. 
Um, I, yeah, so that the, the ones I've looked into are using that. Um, others, I, you know, and then Pantheon, of course, has their own, you know, proprietary way of sort of making distributions. Platform.sh, um, spin-off of Commerce Guys, um, also proprietary, but, you know, by people we like. Um, I think has some way of also building platforms on platforms. Um, but yeah, Agar is the, 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 the free software way to go, and there's been a lot of energy like continuously and, and renewed energy recently in that in that community. Um, and, and they're it's working, they're hosting things, so Not um, the um, yeah. Sorry, I think check out Open Aid. I know it's got a different focus, but it might be a good basis anyway. It's it's one of the stronger ones, and it it's sort of it's a little bit campaign focused. And there's another one I'm blanking on, um, but I don't know how up to date it was. That these were mostly pulled from active distributions, so things that weren't on this list probably haven't had an update in a little while, um, which, you know, doesn't mean they're no-go, but, um, yeah, th these are some of the most active on Drupal.org right now. Yes. dodged all of that. It's like, look, these companies are valued in the billions based primarily on your data. Someone thinks it has value there. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the interesting thing is that, like, I mean, we do have to, I mean, I, I'm not really going to go, you know, labor through value or any of that stuff, but just decouple value from dollar value. It's like, you know, like the, the class example is air and water. You know, it's like sometimes economists try to put a value on this, but it's like, if you, no, it's not good if we had to pay for them. Um, you know, in, in you know, it, it just doesn't work. Like, it, it makes everything else worse. And I think a lot of this data is at that level. It's like, you know, we need social networks. You know, it's part of what humanity needs at this time. Um, you know, if they can't, you know, if we structure it so that you can't extract, if you can't force us to watch ads and stuff, and therefore there's no such thing as a, you know, $400 billion social network, that's that's fine. Um, but we still, on the other hand, we still need, we still need business models. Like, I'm trying to, like, so like, you know, companies installing solar panels need to make money too. Um, and, you know, I, Definitely all, you know, in a worker own cooperative, I'm all for more cooperative things. Um, you know, profit isn't the end all and be all, but it's um, a Ben Wordmuller, who I was quoting there from the Indie Web Camp community, um, is very explicit and uses some swear words to make the point that, you know, just because it's free, free software in the freedom sense, um, you absolutely, like, the idea that you shouldn't be making money on it um, is, is crazy. And that there is is a real value. Um, there's a real importance to um, to having 
Huh? You know, well, his is around like this, that, that there's some way that you can say, okay, I am providing well, we're, we're doing a service to people, I'm providing value to people, I'm improving the software, I'm making it possible for people to control their own data. Like, that's the real trick is, is figure out what the business model is there. And again, that could, you know, these things I think can be hybrid the same way that things are hybrid in the real world. We have, you know, our transportation system is pretty much socialistic you know the 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 roads the rails all of this stuff you know would never have gotten there in the first place without huge public investment um and if large groups of people come together and say we're going to provide our own infrastructure that's fantastic also um you know our own infrastructure on the internet and so I can see some of that happening, and then, and then, like the commercial business models can be built on top of that. Like, you know, you've got the highways out there, and the buses are on it. The Chinatown buses came and created a whole new category of transportation: fifteen dollars from Boston to New York. And you know, if you have people coming together in larger numbers to say, "Okay, we're controlling," you know, our data is important to us. We're going to like have a consortium to control our data, um, that may be more realistic than like one private company figuring out a business model for, you know, actually um, honestly ethically handling, you know, millions and millions and millions of people's um, data, billions of people's data. Um, but once you have that underlying um, sort of cooperative or non-profit consortium, um, then I think you have, then you have what we have with the the internet, then you have the ability to have lots of exciting commercial ventures built um, on top and alongside that. So that, I guess, sort of the the broader political economy that was sort of in my my head as as the most likely um, result of people thinking about um, you know what they want to control in their lives as far as their software and their data and and what could come out of that. Thank you. Or yeah. show somebody how it works. You should really go through it. Yeah. Step first, and show the demo. Then click here. Oh, is that an error? Right, right. Okay. So you were invited to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's all. It puts all of the data in in a Git repository, um, which is which is weird to us. But like I. Um, but so my idea that, oh wow, we just like made a, a front end for editing this um, and, and, and then let the, let, you know, front end for editing it, but let the, the data stay in version control, stay in a Git repository, be a, f when it's served, it's a flat file site, you know, great performance, no security risks, no Drupal getting with, you know, when your personal site is output as, um, as 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 you know, just flat files, um, and and then that's basically what um, um, what the grid.io is doing. They're like saying we're going to have artificial intelligence like put your data together, but then it's going to be saved into um, saved into version control and saved into flat files and served that way. So that's why I think there's a huge opportunity for Drupal to be like. This is actually this this back to the future type thing. This you know this way of constructing static websites is is the way to go um, because yeah it's like there's no reason for most websites to be um, a content management system anymore. But um, but you know that doesn't mean people should be going back to editing you know full HTML files and and breaking their um, you know, and breaking our, you know, your lovely designs. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I really do think there's a, could be really exciting hybrid um, models where you have, you know, different, you know, Drupal distributions actually working or, you know, it's one Drupal site that people log into to generate their individual flat files. And the same as um, the grid is promising, they're like, you can export it as Jekyll. You can export it as um, as as anything, and so your data is always you know free and out there, and that's it's very much Drupal's promise also. And there are a lot of other static site generators. Um, I, the one I actually use mostly is Pelican. It's written in 
Python. There's also a Python one called Hide, naturally, since there's a Jekyll. Um, and I'm sure there are PHP ones, <laughs> which might make the integration easier. Um, but I mean, static site generation is, is pretty easy. But it is really a throwback to what a lot of people eventually came to Drupal doing. You know, first we're like trying to build their own like content management system. And it's just basically flat files with a little bit of PHP in there to add in the headers and footers. And I, I see us coming full circle. But I, I think that is sort of the user experience people need. Simple editing. It gets output to flat files, and they never have to worry about, you know, maintenance um, in 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 that way. Um, again, and it's pretty easy to switch the system that's doing the editing, because um, uh, there is really a, the standard developing around markdown files or other you know .rst files that all of the static site generators are using, which is why the grid .io can say this is what we're going to base our content on, and it's a genuine promise that you can take your content and take it somewhere else. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, everybody. That brings us up to 